Welcome to episode 493. This week, fundamentalist Bob Jones University has a fashion design department. What could possibly go wrong? We then discuss a new study that says evangelicals see the world primarily in categories of good and evil, while non-believers don't. We unpack the implications. Then I talk to art historian Matthew Milliner about his new book, The Everlasting People, G.K. Chesterton and the First Nations. All of that, plus new animal news, and Phil learns some new aviation etiquette. Hey there, welcome to the Holy Post Podcast. My name is Phil Vischer. I'm here with Caitlin Chess. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Phil. And Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hey, everyone. Hey. And we got Jason Rugg beaming in from North Aurora, East Aurora, West Aurora, South West Aurora. Aurora. West Aurora. West Aurora. West Aurora. West Aurora, but not all the way to Sugar Grove. No. No. Did you know West Aurora and East Aurora actually used to be different cities and then they merged in like Whoa. 1920? Yeah. Wow. Was it yeah. like, did they to become the superpower that they are now? <laughs> yeah. Was it joint <laughs> forces? That everyone knows about. Everyone knows like about Like Voltron. Aurora. East yeah. Aurora. But North Aurora is a different city, right? <laughs> yes. Yep. They're their own city. So, yep. so were there three different Auroras? Was there East and yeah. West and North Aurora? <laughs> but what no was South. that all about? Yeah. But no South, South is Montgomery. Aurora. I don't know. <laughs> That's weird. And then they merged to get. So why hasn't North Aurora merged? Because just Aurora is the second biggest city in Illinois now, right? Yeah. I mean, if you add in North Aurora, I mean, North Aurora isn't that big, so I don't think yeah. it would really. It's not probably, Caitlin, aren't you yeah. just so happy you tuned in for big. this <laughs> bit of I, Illinois I to, geography? I used to think that Jason lived in Colorado because I thought that was the only oh. Aurora I knew about. Yeah. So yeah, this is yeah. just a lot no, of information. Aurora, <laughs> Illinois is best known as the site where... Um, Mike Myers and Dana Carvey did uh, that. What movie is that? Wayne's World. Wayne's World. Wayne's World. That's where Wayne's World was from. They were in Aurora. It was set there, but it wow. wasn't actually filmed there. Correct? No, they yeah. shot parts of it. Uh, the movie. They shot parts of the movie. Well, well they shot the uh, movie uh, all over Chicago area. Surely some of it was shot in Aurora. I don't think so. I don't. I, I haven't seen the movie in forever, but I remember okay. there's like a pineapple white castle and all sorts of weird stuff, and it's like we don't have any of that. So. Yeah, I think they made a lot of it up. Uh, okay. Well, they, I mean, they drove by the giant car sculpture that's on Skokie Boulevard or Cicero. or Yeah, but that's like in Berwyn. I know. I know. But it, they, so they were shooting in the Chicago area. Surely they swung by Aurora for something. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of shootings in the Chicago area. Doesn't mean hey. that it's special. Hey. Sorry. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> now it's time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. Boy, Sky, you really put a gloom on that one. <laughs> See, Caitlin, you'd never say anything like that, would you? Never, no. Never, <laughs> never. But she's not from here, so that would have been rude for her no, to say that. No, because she's classy. She's classy. Mm, yeah, mm. thank you. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely classy. All right, uh, we need to start with a little animal news because this is just fascinating. So there was a truck, and the truck was driving in uh, Pennsylvania, and it ran into a truck with a trailer, ran into a dump truck. And that's only interesting because of what was in the trailer behind the truck. Do you know what was in the trailer behind the truck that ran into the dump truck? I'm guessing animals. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You <laughs> are quick. <laughs> that's why oh, I'm here. A lot of animals? There were 100 monkeys. <laughs> 100 like a children's 100? book. That does 100 sound like a monkeys <laughs> were in the trailer. No Why? Monkey. Why? That's a good question. That's a good question. Why do you think there would be a trailer driving through Pennsylvania with 100 monkeys in it? I have no idea. If there was a few, I would think like zoo transportation. But that uh -huh. many, I feel like yeah. something shady is going on. That's a lot of monkeys. That yeah. is a lot. I think that's all that I can say is that is a lot of monkeys. It's like a Dr. Seuss book. You're yeah. a Dr. Seuss you know, to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street, a trailer with a hundred <laughs> monkeys. Um, it was going to a lab. They were taking oh. they were taking one hundred monkeys to a lab. For what purpose? 
So I had a field trip. I'm just going to say no, field not trip. Good. Not good. <laughs> it was, you know, it was may, the fourth grade class from the monkey school. That's what maybe, the Dr. Seuss ooh. book says. Maybe they were needing some test subjects for like, you know, genetically modified bananas that are extra delicious. And these monkeys were about to have oh. a great. Let's yeah. go with that. Let's yeah. go with that. Let's go with that. So the trailer tipped over. The monkey, this is crazy. Each monkey was in its own crate. So there's a hundred crated monkeys. How not, long not in a eat? barrel, huh? <laughs> what? They weren't in a barrel. No, they weren't in a barrel. No, that's a different children's book. You're in a different <laughs> children's book now. So the crates spilled out all over the highway, each one with a monkey in it. Three monkeys got loose, got out of their crates. And like mm. five different government agencies in Pennsylvania <laughs> had to search to find the three monkeys that were just loose in suburbia. Wasn't and, there a wasn't there a Matthew Broderick movie like this with this oh, plot? Or the, or you we bought a zoo. There was that one. No, what, what, there was what one Matthew like, Broderick movie. Yeah, where he there was a chimpanzee that escaped from some kind of like NASA lab, and he ended up getting this monkey, and the government was after it. Project X, 1997. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very wow. much. Wow. Anywho, anywho, the good news is they found the three monkeys that got out. Oh. Bad news is 100 monkeys had to go to a lab. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just trying, honestly, I'm trying to figure out what lab needs 100 monkeys all at once. You know, like if you, like over 10 years, you say, wow, you know. We've had 100 monkeys in, in and out of here over the last 10 years. But one lab needs, hey, can you get us 100 monkeys t by Tuesday? We need 100. Like, what the heck are you doing? And where do you put in that order exactly? <laughs> monkeys are us? Yeah. The monkey monkey.com? I don't know. I don't, it also sounds like a crazy. failed escape plot. Like, it seems like they were very close to successfully freeing the monkeys. Yeah. Who's they? The monkeys? The monkeys or another party? <laughs> I don't know. It sounds almost like Finding Nemo, where they like get finally get out of the yeah, tank, right, right. but then they're now, still in the little bags that they kind of were stuck in their crates. Here's where it really gets fun if you learn that the dump truck was also driven by monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> See? See? Yeah, yeah. Now we now we're making a now we're making a <laughs> Disney Plus movie. <laughs> sounds like a drinking song too. Um, a hundred crates with monkeys, monkeys on the wall. Crates crates of, crates in the monkeys. trailer is one of those <laughs> monkeys that happen to fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, I need to do something else now. <laughs> so if you know why one lab would need a hundred monkeys stat, let us know. Reach out to us because <laughs> frankly, I'm concerned. This is like, you know, secret of NIM kind of scary territory. This mm -hmm. is how Planet of the Apes starts. How yes. Planet of the Apes starts is when the monkeys on their way to the lab uh, rock their trailer so much that they tip it over, they escape, and they start building their own society. In Pennsylvania. Our monkey overlords. Say hello to the monkey overlords of Pennsylvania. <laughs> but last week on the show, I did uh, a story that made Christian say, why don't you save these for when Caitlin's on the show? Because she loves these stories more than I do. That's so rude. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's such a good point. That's such a good point. Uh, so I need, because I usually don't do, you know, I don't do these stories multiple weeks in a row, typically. I feel like that's wise. Typically, because they're not everyone's favorite. Yeah, and I, true. And I try to please the people. I try to please the people. But you can't please all the people all the time. And it is Caitlin's turn. So now it's time for News of the Butt. And now it's time for News of the Butt. Okay. What should you not do on an airplane if you're flying like over the Atlantic that you could get so you in trouble? So many things. So many things. <laughs> How about this? How about if you should not expose your buttocks and throw a can? What? what? At another passenger. This sounds like monkey behavior. Was there a monkey on, on the plane? <laughs> no, but there was a 29-year-old 20, man from Galway, Ireland, um, was flying from Dublin, Dublin to New York City. A passenger who refused to wear a mask on a flight from Dublin to New York pulled down his pants and exposed his buttocks, threw a can at a passenger, and put his cap on the captain's head multiple times and told him, don't touch me. How did he get access to the captain? <laughs> yeah. I think, 
I think the captain had come out to try to intervene deal with an unruly uh, passenger. Shane McInerney, 29, of Galway, Ireland. Ah, top of the morning. Maybe it was a leprechaun. Maybe it was. <laughs> really? Here we go again. Hi. Hi. I'm going to drop my little hat on you. Hi. <laughs> Oh, now you're a leprechaun too. <laughs> Would you like to see my green buttocks? I, okay. I just want to know, was, was there alcohol involved in this incident? It there, had to be. It, it, there had to be. There had yeah. to be. Um, Shane McHenry, 29, of Galway, Ireland, was charged with intentionally assaulting and intimidating a crew member, prosecutors said. If convicted, now this is why you shouldn't do this, Caitlin, if, if you're thinking... Yeah. Is it that bad to do this? You know, it's just, I mean, how many kids, you know, expose their buttocks on the school bus and they don't have this happen to them? No I one was remember, thinking this. I do remember that happening when I was a kid in Muscatine, Iowa, that somehow my mother and I ended up driving behind a school bus from our local middle school and then a kid in the back row got up and mooned our car out the back window of the school bus. So something about transportation systems. <laughs> <laughs> and mooning, and they never use the phrase mooning. You know this mooning. This is mooning, right, Caitlin? Is it mooning? Yeah, in the, yes. Is, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's not like a, a term that's gone out of fashion. What else would it be called? <laughs> Exposing one's buttocks. <laughs> that's, that takes too long to say. <laughs> hey, watch me! I'm going to expose my buttocks. Um, okay. So get this. Mr. McInerney had refused to wear a mask, despite being asked to do so dozens of times during the eight-hour flight. Then he threw an empty beverage can, hitting another passenger in the head, and kicked the seat back in front of him, disturbing the passenger there. At one point, he walked from his seat in the economy section to the first class section and complained to a flight attendant about the food. While being escorted back to his seat, Mr. McInerney pulled down his pants and underwear and exposed his buttocks to the flight attendant and passengers sitting nearby. <laughs> About two hours into the flight, the captain, while on a break, spoke to Mr. McInerney. The statement said, during the conversation, Mr. McInerney twice took off his cap, put it on the captain's head, and then removed it again. The statement said, he put his fist close to the captain's face and said, don't touch me. I'm a magical what? leprechaun. No, no. I've actually, touch I've, been on a, I've been on a flight very much like that. What? what? <laughs> Where that I, happened? Yeah, well, there was a magical ver- leprechaun exposing no. his little green buttocks. Oh, okay. Not quite. And that, was... by, by the way, that's the new marshmallow they're adding to Lucky Charms. <laughs> the little no, green buttocks. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a flight from Sydney, Australia to, I think, Los Angeles. It was 14 hours or some horrifically long flight. And I was all the way in the back of this 747 in, in the economy section. This is back when they still allowed smoking on planes. So there was a lot of smoking. I remember freezing to death because I had the air blasting on me to try to keep the, the air clear. And across the aisle from me were these two Australian men who I don't know if they'd ever been on an airplane before, but they, they were wearing like whitey tidy shirts. They had very, very large bellies that like hung over their tray and they were drinking copious amounts of alcohol throughout this flight and being really, really loud. And then they got really obnoxious and flight attendants came over and were trying to calm them down. And then it got physical, like oh, angry. It, it, was, it, was, wow. it was very entertaining, very loud, very boisterous. Um, were buttocks involved? No, but like I said, there were large bellies exposed, which hmm. were about as attractive as seeing their buttocks is, I suppose. Uh, but I, think, I, think I mean, they uh, weren't great representatives of their country on that flight. Did you tell them? Did you point that out to them? I didn't have to because the flight attendants <laughs> were. But okay. it, it was, it got ugly. It got, and, and, and you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It isn't like you have anywhere to go. And what do you do with these two guys who are drunk out of their skulls? That's, and, that's where the zip ties and the duct tape come in handy. Yeah, well, this is back in the 90s. We didn't do that kind of stuff on planes. Take them to their chairs. So here's why, okay, Caitlin, if you're asking me, because I know you are, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? I mean, why wouldn't you do that? It would enliven the flight. People would get a kick out of it. Why shouldn't you do that? Well, let me tell you, Caitlin, because if he's convicted of what he's been charged with, he faces up to 20 years in prison. Is that an Irish prison or an American prison? (laughs) <laughs> I don't know if they sent him back home. <sighs> Twenty. What years. airline was it? Does it say? I think it was an Irish. Ah, when Irish airline smiling, it was. Uh, I don't. Oh, oh no, it was Delta. It was a Delta flight <laughs> from I- Ireland to New York. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hi. 
Yeah, well, that's, that's, wasn't there that's another flight? Luck of the Irish. Wasn't there another flight recently that was out over the Atlantic and somebody refused to wear their mask and they actually turned around and yes, yeah, diverted back. Yeah, this is this is getting worse. People are, and it's it's weird. What what is it's about masks that really annoys us, and because we're so upset about masks, then we just kind of lose all sense of self restraint and do terrible things. Well. The guy's being consistent, though. Remember we did that story a while back that said you could catch COVID from farts, but we don't have to worry about it because pants function as butt masks. So he refused to cover either end and was probably exposing people to all kinds of I, viruses. Oh, right. See, uh, Caitlin, I just have to point out that this was really a fun story until Sky turned it into passing gas, which is You know not, what I need to point out? That I think... I think Christian and I need to band together instead of fighting. So I'm not going to say that you should save them for her. I'm going to say that we need to be a united front against news of the butt. If you organize like monkeys on a trailer, I'm going to be very... <laughs> yeah, you should be worried. You should be worried about the two All of right. us. It Can sounds like I have a lot of power in this because if you could... Whoever wants to win me over to their side will have a majority. <laughs> we'll start campaigning. We'll start campaigning for Sky's support. <laughs> I can be bribed. Hmm. Good to know. Good to know. And this has been the news of the butt, of the Irish butt. This has been the news of the butt. All right. I like how they, because it was a classy uh, newspaper, they say buttocks instead of butt. They don't want to say butt. Uh, can we talk about fashion design? This is a fascinating <laughs> story. This is a fascinating story. I found this fascinating. First of all, first of all, Sky Jatani. Can I call you Sky Jatani? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Did you know that Bob Jones University has a program for fashion design? I did not know that, Phil. Of, of, is there a university that you would think less likely to teach fashion design than Bob Jones? I don't know. Is there an Amish university? Well, they have to. They have their own school of fashion, so they have to keep that tradition going. <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of innovation going on there, though. No. But you, you got to learn how to do the hooks and the eyes. <laughs> it's like, like buttonless fashion design. So they they need to teach it. They need to teach it. I just okay. I had no idea they have more than a hundred programs in fine arts at Bob Jones University. Okay, that's, that's kind of stunning. So one of the programs that BJU offers that is unique among Christian universities in the Eastern United States, which implies that there must be a Christian university in the Western United States that's raising the next generation of Christian fashion designers for the mission field. Um, they have a Bachelor of Science degree in fashion design. The website, the BJU website explains, and here's the quote about this, God is the source of all beauty, the giver of good gifts to mankind, even the gift of beautiful clothing. Okay. Well, that's one of his original gifts to mankind, as we okay. read about in Genesis 3. Was that, was fig leaves? Were well, no, he, he, he created clothing for oh, Adam and Eve skins. from the yeah, animal skin. skin. Yeah, because right. they were trying to do fashion design with fig leaves, and that's hard. That's just hard. Not much to work with. At BJU, you'll learn how having a right view of God informs your values and daily decisions and gives you the motivation to create beautiful and useful apparel. You'll learn how God's character, including his creativity, holiness, and goodness, can energize you in your field as you create attractive and modest clothing for his glory. That, that's the word, isn't it? That kind of yeah. makes it's, it um, a Bob Jones yeah. apartment. I mean, you... I, I, but really, a lot of what that statement says is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, like, amen. It's, okay. So yeah. we're happy about that. But we've had a little bit of a problem. We had a little bit of a problem. 2021, they organized the first Bob Jones University fashion show um, across several different departments to come together and put on a fashion show. And there's a student named uh, Matthew Fox who made a collection. He designed a collection that he wanted to represent the gospel. He said, I wanted my collection to impact the culture at BJU and help people see that fashion is just as valid and capable of, of an art form to communicate beauty. Beyond the superficial gender performative box that it's put in on campus, I wanted my work to sing with a beauty and intensity that reached the depths of the despair I felt and embodied and resolved that for others to see. So I chose to illustrate the gospel in fashion. 
on the bodies of other people, I wanted people to look at bodies, not to condemn the boobs and collarbones or tightness of pants or length of skirts. I wanted people to see the image of God. I wanted people to see the beauty and scandal of a holy God becoming his creation in order to redeem it. I wanted to bridge our mental separation of the being of God from the physical body that he keeps. That seems like a rather ambitious goal at Bob Jones University. Uh, yeah. So how did sure. it go? Are you asking? You want to know how it went? I'm asking. How did Let's it go? Let's just say it <laughs> didn't go well. Ooh. Um, he made four different designs. Uh, I think one, what was? Matthew, first... Mark, Luke, and John? No. No. Mm, oh, first you should up, do that. First up. <laughs> first up is Eve. Uh, she is shocking. On the runway, she's covered in blood. She has a handprint on her face and a shredded outfit to show the violence of the fall enacted physically on a perfect creation. Her skirt fabric is royal blue, like the new creation skirt. Uh, so, okay, so that's Eve. Next up is Satan. You're supposed to hate him. I'd originally thought of having blood dripping from his hands, but I didn't want to make a mess on the runway. So Satan is void of color. He has no color and markedly different in everything in his style lines. The hem of his pants is shredded to bind him to the destruction he's caused. The villainy lays plain. The third piece was where he got into trouble. The third piece was Jesus. Um, he designed a wrap coat for Jesus. It's red to signify blood. Jesus bled and died. He's, he covered our sins completely and fully like a wrap coat covers the body completely and fully. Here's where he got into trouble. A wrap coat is not a very masculine garment. I don't even know what a wrap coat is. What is it, a wrap coat? You can Google it. It's, you would tip, it's more of a woman's coat. <laughs> it's not like a coat that a wrapper well, wears? <laughs> no. 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 Um, the problem was, is that his Jesus design made the model, in, in the eyes of some people, look like a gay man. Unfortunately, um, people didn't like it. One pastor said, it's straight up blaf blasphemous. Another pastor said, uh, it's gross. Another pastor said, it makes me sick. Another How many pastor pastors were at this fashion show? No, they all saw pictures. Oh, because okay. somebody somebody blogged about it that it was, and they went to Bob Jones. Yes, these are all yeah. pastors that were graduates of Bob Jones. Another one said the whole thing seems quite worldly. Worldly. Uh, mm -hmm. Another pastor said this is what happens when Christians model their college programs after those of sodomites. Another pastor said he looked like a gay man and was wearing a crown of thorns. What is so hard to understand about that? It's blasphemous. People began calling for faculty members to lose their jobs over the fashion project. The board of trustees had to meet a number of times since, uh, to talk about the project in order to figure out how to handle it. They finally issued a statement. The big concern reportedly was that Fox's look for Jesus was too feminine, which they believe blurs Jesus' distinctiveness as a man. But... Okay, Mike, obviously I know nothing more than what you've said, but was his intent to depict actual Eve, actual Satan, actual Jesus, or was just the clothing these models were wearing were to represent those characters? Yes, the yeah. clothing was to represent the characters, the design okay. of so the clothes. You're asking your audience to understand something metaphorically and symbolically rather than literally. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Here's maybe the real issue. So here's the fallout. The board has issued a statement which says, when the young man displayed the scarlet coat representing Christ, it was clearly sacrilegious and blasphemous. No wonder so many cried out against what they saw on social media. Worst of all, this dishonored the Lord Jesus Christ. For these actions, we are grieved as leaders and humbly confess this offense to the Lord and you. In response to this egregious event, the executive leadership and board of trustees acted immediately. Our administrative and academic leadership, along with our art and design faculty, have taken full responsibility to correct these problems and are making significant changes within the program itself. We are establishing clear policies and procedures to prevent a similar instance in the future. We want to ensure BJU family and friends this will not happen again. So here's a question. What kind of policies would you put in place to keep someone from representing Jesus on a wrap coat? <laughs> oh, and, yeah. And because it, it comes down to, and this was the point of the article. This was an article in um, 
uh, the Baptist News Global, which is not an SBC publication. It's a more of a a more liberal Baptist publication. Their point was that it shows Bob Jones' uh, commitment to the created order in their view, that God created this order that used to include race distinctions, you know, and then they quote from uh, Bob Jones Sr. talking, using some of the same language they're using here about gender, about the races, that if God intended the races to be together, he wouldn't have created the distinctions between the races. And in this case, if God intended the genders to be blurred, he wouldn't have created distinct genders. So it's it's partly the, the angle of this article is, you know, it's the kind of fundamentalist push to keep the created order with very clear lines. And Jesus should not wear a coat that looks like a woman's coat. Okay. There's multiple problems with that. Number, let me just highlight two. The first one is that what passes for masculine or feminine in any given culture changes. So just because in the Southern United States in 2021, the kind of coat that this young man designed appears more feminine. If you were to take that same coat to another culture, they might go, wow, that's the most manly coat I've ever seen because it's Mm -hmm. completely subjective what those categories entail. But more importantly, this is why you never or rarely, I should say, I shouldn't say never, but this is why you rarely see really great art coming out of fundamentalist cultures. Because really great art has to speak and function on multiple levels simultaneously. And fundamentalism of any variety, not just Christian fundamentalism, but fundamentalism in it in its core says there is only ever one meaning to anything. Hmm. It can't have multiple layers of meaning or depth. The metaphor, simile, poetry, artistry, all those things require a far more imaginative mind. And yep. it sounds like this young man, Matthew Fox, was that his name? He possesses yep. that quality. He understands that dynamic of faith and art. But there were others in that community who clearly did not. And so they couldn't get past the fact that this coat was supposed to represent something more than just the person wearing it. And that's right. sad because I, what they probably did in the, in the act of appeasing the people who were upset is they probably lost the respect of a bunch of other people who understood the artistic nature of what this young man was trying right. to do. Right. It, and I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how how you could create structure to prevent that from happening again and still have a creative program. You know, it's kind of like, the, did you see the controversy over the, um, the portraits, the, uh, the portraits of Mary, uh, black Mary holding a, a black Jesus that looked like George Floyd and uh, I think it was Catholic American University or Catholic University had two copies of them and it created such a scandal that they were comparing Jesus to George Floyd that uh, both copies were stolen off the wall. Mm-hmm. I didn't hear that. You didn't hear about that? Yeah, it's, it's, we, it's, we have a hard time accepting symbolism. You know, but we, the, don't, we don't have a hard time with the, what the, the the Solomon portrait of Jesus that hangs in a lot of evangelical churches, which depicts him as a blonde haired blue eyed European. That's not symbolism. That's just what we, <laughs> what we, what yeah. we used to think he looked like. <clears throat> used to. Yeah. Made in, made in the image of the people yeah, well, who. Mo- most of us now recognize, okay, he probably was, was more tan than that because of, you know, latitude. Hmm. But yeah, so, so I just, I'm trying to figure out how, how can you be creative and, and try to charge, you know, the next generation of, if you want Christian kids to be creative and they say, I, I think I have a way I want to, I want to tell the gospel story that's unusual. Then how do you make rules so that it never comes out in a way that could be misunderstood right? without mm-hmm. just saying, we're not going to, we're not going to be creative like this. I, I don't understand how you could have a fashion design program at all at a fundamentalist university. I mean, and I kind of applaud them for trying, but you know, now what do you do? Caitlin, any wisdom here? Well, I think one thing when I was reading the article that you sent, Phil, was just what a picture this is of how institutions like that function. It could be an issue of gender like this one is, where I do think we've just totally 
lost what's happening when it comes to, like you said, the like cultural situatedness of gender expressions and the way that, I mean, Jesus might not have worn that coat, also would not have worn the kind of picture of masculine fashion that they might imagine. Like neither of those depictions would have made sense for Jesus. That's a whole element of what's happening here. But I thought it was also just such a picture of how institutions like you said, acquiesce to the loudest voices, typically people with money, and do so in such a damaging way. Like my heart really broke hearing the line that you read, Phil, about the way they described this young man's work of like, this was counter to Jesus. This was against the gospel. Like what an incredibly damaging thing for him as a person, right? For a Christian that's trying to faithfully do what God has called them to do in this unique gifting that they have. And I'm sure that place was a hard place for him to be to begin with. The how how swashing of a person can you get? But then how often is that true of a whole institution? So it's not just like, what rules could they come up with to make sure this doesn't happen again? Even if they didn't actually come up with any new rules, just something like this tells people that if you step outside, outside the line, we're not just going to say, hey, this isn't kind of our culture or, hey, this kind of upset some people. So we're going to be quiet. No, we're going to say this was against the gospel and you did something sacrilegious and blasphemous. And it's no wonder that young people that are trying to be creative and think about their faith in different ways than their parents did think that the only option is to just straight up leave the church. And I've seen right. that happen in other institutions and churches where we just tighten the borders because we're freaked out by what's happening. We're acquiescing to people with power and money. And so instead of trying to figure out how to bring reconciliation, how to take seriously the concerns of the people who are upset, I do think what's coming from the people who are upset are some really kind of um, Yes, the kind of power hungry, we've got to hold on to cultural dominance and to Christian dominance in the US. But I also think a legitimate sense of it's frightening when things that were norms for you your entire life are shifting and you're reacting out of fear to those norms shifting in ways that make you uncomfortable. We could have a conversation in Christian institutions between people who have that fear and people who are trying to be faithful in a, in a creative way that's different from what those other people expect. And we could come to some sort of resolution, we could find reconciliation, but instead our impulse most of the time is to just tighten down the borders of what's acceptable, kick out the people who are causing trouble, and make sure that the people with the most money get the most preference in those things. And we're going to have institutions die because of that. I wonder, I mean, if they they believe that depicting Jesus symbolically with this more feminine kind of coat was sacrilegious, how would the same people have reacted if the model had come out with an American flag cape and an, a bald eagle on his shoulder and army fatigues with assault rifles. Would that have been sacrilegious in a depiction of Jesus in the gospels? Because I don't know, Sky. Arguably that is just as, if not more sacrilegious than a, co- so we, yeah, we have selective outrage in the way. Yes, we do. We what react was, to these things. What was the other interesting angle of the story that the author brought up was the the similarity in language between how you know Bob Jones the third defended their ban on interracial dating with how they are defending outrage about an androgynous coat uh, representing. Jesus. And and he actually quotes, you know, because Bob Jones was on Larry King in 2000. And this was when they were criticized because uh, George W. Bush spoke on campus. And then everyone said, hey, they won't let interracial, they don't, don't allow interracial dating. Mm-hmm. Uh, why are you a presidential candidate speaking there? And Bob Jones, the third went on Larry King to, to explain. And when, and, and this is a quote from the story, when King asked Jones why BJU prohibits interracial dating, Jones explained, we don't let them date because we stand against the one world government, against the coming world of Antichrist, which is a one world system of blending all the differences. Right. But so then they actually reverse that policy. Yes. At that they, time. Right. Like, like yeah. that well, year. <laughs> it, it actually happened while he was on yeah. the Larry King show. Oh, my gosh. He, he said, uh, he said, the principle is is very, very important. But the, the rule itself, he says, we don't have to have that rule. He then announced that they would decided to reverse the ban in light of what it was doing to their cause and their testimony. But after they returned uh, back to Bob Jones University, the new ruling was you have to have a letter from your parents explicitly giving you permission to date another race. Even though you're an adult. 
Uh, yes, it doesn't matter how old you are. You need to have a letter from your parents so, saying you can date another race. And then he quotes from uh, Bob Jones Sr. Uh, when Billy Graham was taking a trip to South Africa and was going to have integrated rallies and use this idea of the created order again. says, white people have helped the colored people build their churches and we've gotten along together harmoniously and peacefully and everything has come along fine. Keep in mind, this was 1960. So this is before any of the civil rights legislation that happened in the 1960s. Everything in the 60s, everything has come along fine. Sometimes we have a little trouble, but then we adjust everything sensibly and get back to the established order. There is an effort today to disturb the established order. If we would just listen to the word of God and not try to overthrow God's established order, we would not have any trouble. When someone goes to overthrowing his established order, that makes me sick. Uh, that I, was the justification for segregation. I, I don't know what's worse, a segregationist or a hypocritical segregationist. Because yes. if, if you are a segregationist and you are basing that belief in scripture and you are invoking God's created order to justify segregation and you sincerely believe that, then stick to it. But when well, you fold, when you give uh, up on that because of political pressure and financial pressure, what you're admitting is that this is not based in genuine theological or religious conviction. It's based in cultural values that you're willing to capitulate on when it's going to cost you something. Yeah. Bob Jones Sr. did stick to it till the end of his life. It was Yeah, his but grand, the institution his, didn't. His grandson changed the position, finally. It took two generations to change the position. I, I think what I'm... What I'm more interested in, and then this was the point of this article, is that the, some of the identical language that was used to keep races separate is now being used to keep gender roles separate. And even not even gender roles, like, you know, women shouldn't be senior pastors, but men shouldn't have long hair. Men shouldn't wear wrap coats. <laughs> men need to, you know, there was a, a controversial tweet last week from Owen Strauss. Draken, Strucken, Strucken, whatever his name is, just saying, you know, to be obedient to God, men, and and cut off your man buns. You know, man buns are a disgrace uh, to to godly manliness. You know, and I tweeted. They're a disgrace, but I think for other reasons. Yeah, I, 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 I <laughs> tweeted back, be manly like Samson, cut your hair short. <laughs> that didn't work either. It's just, mm -hmm. it's this, you know, it's this insane, we have to patrol the lines that we believe are in the created order, you know, and we, it's not about race anymore. We were wrong. We were wrong about that, that line, but it's definitely, we cannot have androgynous Jesus fashion. I just, I mean, I, to, this applies to a whole wide variety of topics and opinions, but it seems like people in order to validate their point of view, they want to they want to give divine sanction to what they believe. You can have all kinds of ideas about gender roles, fashion, hairstyles, whatever, but why do you have to base it all, or politics for that matter, why do you have to base it all in this is what God says? Like even Paul was secure enough to say, I say this, not the Lord. This is my opinion, not God's. Mm -hmm. And so have your opinions, make your arguments, advocate for what you believe in, but when you invoke divine authority for everything, it ends up just being ridiculous. Yeah. Well, it's the Trump card, you know, because now my enemy is rejecting. Right. You know, like accusing Kristen Kobes de May and Beth Allison Barr of they've abandoned inerrancy of scripture. You know, it's not that they're doing historical research to challenge some of the cultural accommodations we've added to our faith. It's that they're abandoning the inerrancy of scripture, which is core, of course, to evangelicalism. So they're abandoning evangelicalism and becoming, you know, modernists, yeah. ma mainliners. Well, I don't okay. I think the, I think coffee is an abomination, but I'm not going to like condemn somebody who loves coffee and say it's the devil's drink. I, it's just an opinion I hold. <laughs> That's how, how I feel did about. I not know that about how, you, Sky. That's how horrific. I feel about golf. <laughs> yeah. Like Phil, you feel that way about golf. I do. Yeah. Do Although indeed. you do condemn people who play golf, and you did call it the devil's sport. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. I did. Well, mm -hmm. it's not part of the created order because <laughs> the grass just wants to grow. <laughs> not be 
not be. The Bible says, let your grass grow. Do not what? cut it to one eighth of an inch against its will. That is the honor of the earth is long grass. <laughs> right. Thank I, you. Christians, one last story. Yeah. No, Sky, we're done, Sky. Okay, okay. I'm moving on, Sky. <laughs> moving we're on, too. Christians religiously un- unaffiliated differ on whether most things in society can be divided into good and evil. This I found interesting. And I've been trying to get this story in for like four straight weeks, but it wasn't timely, so it kept getting bumped by other timely news. Um, they did a survey. Pew Research did a survey. Do you believe most things in society can be clearly divided into good and evil? Okay, not some things. You're not like, you know, oh, serial killers, evil, uh, Catholic nuns doing charity work, good. You know, yeah, okay, that's some things. But most things can be divided into good and evil. So what percentage of Christians believe most things can be divided into that's good That's a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of things. Yeah, like, like you got to get donuts in there, I'm pretty sure. Trailers full of monkeys have yeah, to be on the I mean, list somewhere. There's a, I'm looking out my window. I see a lot of stuff. I'm pretty sure most of those things, most things. are not good or evil. <laughs> okay, okay. It's not overwhelming, but 54% of all Christians believe most things can be pretty clearly divided into good and evil. The, the largest subgroup? What do you think the largest subgroup is? I'm just going to... I'm just... Wondering if you can even venture a guess. Hmm. Who thinks which Christian group is the hmm. most convinced? Okay, I'll tell you because you're clearly at a loss. White evangelicals. What? What? <laughs> Shocked. Shocked, I tell you. <laughs> white evangelicals. 64% of white evangelicals think most things in society can be clearly divided into good and evil. After that, it's black Protestants at 57%. And then it goes down uh, white non evangelicals, only 46%, less than half. Uh, religiously unaffiliated atheists, I don't, this may come as a shock to you. Only 22% of atheists believe most things in society can be divided into good and evil. Um, so I'm just, okay, so here's, here's what I'm wondering. Are you with me guys? Are you paying attention? Mm -hmm. Are you still with me? Okay. How does that affect our view of politics, our view of the world, how we interact with neighbors? How does it affect our ability to participate in society if we've decided most of what we bump into is either good or evil. Okay. Here's what comes to mind. Do you, you know, Jonathan, <laughs> you know, Jonathan Haidt, Jonathan Haidt, the psychi- yeah. psychologist. No. Uh, he wrote a book called the righteous mind and okay. he co-authored another book about the coddling of the American. What's it? I forget what it's called. American mind. American mind. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, he and others have cited this research. There's this there's this growing field of research known as dis- disgustology. Ooh. And like there was it. an article in the Atlantic I think a couple of years ago about this. So basically what they did is they took they took a sampling of people and they scanned their brains as they are showing them different photographs, including photographs of really disgusting things. Ooh, like gross stuff. And then they were yeah. looking at how did people's <laughs> brains respond? Right. And then they asked people to fill out surveys about their political beliefs and their where, where they fall on the spectrum of conservative to liberal. Right? OK. And they found a, a shocking correlation between people who have a very high disgust reaction to gross things and conservative political beliefs. And huh. there's been tons and tons of research done on this now, and they're finding a correlation and maybe a causal thing in the way our brains are. And I'm not going to represent this super well, but what they're finding is that people with a neurological bent toward having very strong uh, feelings or categorization of things, like things that are clearly good or clearly bad, and they have strong reactions Mm. one way or another, tend to be far more conservative in their politics because they don't tend to do well with ambiguity or, um, and and they just have strong reactions to things. So So if I, if I go to a liberal with poo, they're going to say, oh, okay, that's poo. If I go to well, a conservative, they're going to say, gross. That's well, the, 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 that liberal might, the liberal might still go, oh, that's unappealing. But their, their, their physiological and neurological yeah. response won't be as strong. Won't be as strong. Right. That's and, interesting. And so anyway, they're talking about how the, the 
the brain chemistry of a person who tends to be more conservative is one is is one that prefers clear categories and has strong reactions when those categories are violated. Wow. And when you think about it, that makes a ton of sense. Like in general, mm-hmm. conservatives want strict laws with clear boundaries. Conservatives want a wall on the border to differentiate who's American and who isn't, right? There's it's just they they prefer a black and white way of depicting and understanding the world. And it also explains why people who are more religious tend to be more conservative because religion gives people clear definitions of what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, what's holy right. and unholy, all that. Right. So just the the desire for clear categorization is a conservative trait. And there are certain brain chemistries that are drawn more toward that way of looking at the world. Okay. So it's not right or wrong. It's just the way it is. Sky, can you yeah. articulate the downside of not seeing good and evil in the world? Um, from like a biological point of view? No, just like as, you know, should we not see any good and evil in the world? Oh, clearly not. Yeah, you have to. But it's <laughs> the question is how how large are those categories? Right. Like, like this question is, does everything or most things fall into clear right. categories of good and evil? Like small government is good, large <laughs> government is evil. Right. It, it doesn't allow for nuance of thought or contemplation. Yeah. And it also makes difficult, it makes it difficult to have genuine relationships with people because none of us is entirely evil or entirely good. Right. It does. It brings to mind when I read this, I thought of the saying, you know, what stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Right. And it's just the notion that mm. you can divide everyone into bad guys and good guys. Yeah. And you just want to give guns to all the good guys so that if the bad guys get guns, the good guys can stop them. As if the world is, everyone's walking around with a white hat or a black hat. Yeah. And that you never change hats depending on your emotions or what someone just did to you in traffic. Yeah. Uh, Caitlin, you wrote a book about politics. Yeah. What (laughs) what do you have any thoughts? Have any thoughts? One of the things I think also, I tried to look at the questions that were actually asked, but based on what I read of this study, the way it was worded, it also seems to really hinge on whether or not you think people can perceive the difference between, clearly, between good and evil in all things. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people who grew up in conservative churches, we were so concerned with like postmodernism, truth is relative, you know, it's all wishy-washy, what you believe and what I believe can just both exist. That we had such it's we had it so hammered into our heads. Truth is absolute. It will be what it will be. There is clear answers. It is out there. You can find it. But we conflated absolute truth existing with our ability to perceive it in any given moment with perfect accuracy. So we have this sense of like, yeah, I can go around and make a judgment, like Sky was describing, sometimes a real snap judgment that's more based on prejudice or bias, but I tend to think, I tend to associate that with being rational and reasonable. And I've made a smart decision here when maybe it's just prejudice or bias. But I think that's part of the problem too, is that people just have, and I I think it works both ways. If you're really intent on truth is absolute, that slides into, and I can know the difference between right and wrong at all times. If you're really into, you know, everyone has different perspectives and everyone can kind of look at things in different ways and everyone's, you can slide into, there isn't really any absolute truth, but we really struggle to hold truth is absolute. It is out there. It God is truth, right? There is a, there is a ultimate reality beyond ourselves that is true, and that we can, in some limited ways, access and understand. With but our perception is limited both by being finite, small creatures, and by our fallenness and our sinfulness. Having both of those things at the same time is really hard. And I think one of the things that I've seen a lot of conservative Christians do is move from truth is absolute to. And all of my snap judgments, snap judgments about it are correct. And I can be certain that I have made a correct judgment about a person or an institution or a political party. And once I'm stuck there, that's the correct answer. Instead of maybe I'm finite in my ability to make judgments and I have to have other people correct me. I have to have different perspectives that I value in order to make the best kind of judgments that I can make. But I saw this and I thought, yeah, I know Christians who think that because there is absolute truth out there, they totally know what it is. Yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> hey, one thing. Yes. Um, I, I found the article from The Atlantic in 2019 oh. and about disgustology. And there's this one little quote that I think is interesting. They had both groups look at these images and while they were having brain scans. And, they, and it says, just by looking at the subject's neural responses, 
researchers could predict with more than 95% accuracy whether they were liberal or conservative. Wow. Isn't that crazy? That's kind of terrifying. That yeah. is crazy. So and, what have and, we learned? What have we... Well, is there more? Is there more? Sky? Well, no. And just to, like, I don't want to paint it like conservatives are bad for having this reaction. They, they, they hypothesize that part of the benefit of having that strong reaction is you are, you are more cautious. You're less yeah. likely to, you know, think you're more, mm. less likely to pick up that mushroom and pop exactly. it in your mouth just to see what happens. Right. So to have a clear category of these are plants and foods that are safe to eat and anything that is ambiguous, you react mm -hmm. to because it's dangerous. That's not a so, bad instinct so for survival. Probably a liberal who first ate an oyster. Very likely. Yes. Weirdly specific. We've learned, so what have we learned today? We've learned today that oysters were discovered as edible by liberals. We've mm -hmm. learned that 100 <laughs> monkeys is more monkeys than anyone should need. We've learned don't expose your buttocks on a transatlantic flight or we bad knew that. things will happen. <laughs> no, I just learned that. I have changed my travel plans as a result. Uh, and we've learned, what was our other story? And we've learned that modest clothing can still be blasphemous. If no. it blurs the lines of gender. Hmm. That's fascinating, I well, think. I think we well, learned a lot today. Yeah. What would people do without this podcast? How would they get through yeah. flying and yeah. monkey purchasing um, and fashion? Imagine a imagine hundred monkeys <sighs> launching a new world government wearing androgynous Jesus coats. And that no, thank you. is the children's book I'm going to work on next. <laughs> I would love to see that, Phil. <laughs> Thanks no. for listening, everybody. <laughs> Caitlin, what? What? I don't understand your level of concern. I'm concerned for the children. <laughs> oh, the children. They'll be fine. They'll be fine. Their little brains are elastic. They'll snap right back, wash after wash. All right, we got to go. Thank you for supporting us on Patreon. We have a really great interview coming up. Don't go away. Listen to it. We appreciate you guys, and we'll see you next week. The Holy Post Podcast is funded by listeners like you who support us on Patreon. And this episode is also supported by Abide, the number one Christian meditation app. This is Phil. Do you ever have trouble falling asleep at night? Do you ever wrestle with anxiety? Uh, no? Liar. We all do. Meditation apps are all the rage. But what the heck are you meditating on? Fill your mind with the Bible with the Abide Meditation app. Abide's meditations start at just two minutes long. That's easy. You can do that. Get started now with 25% off a premium subscription by downloading the Abide app at abide.co slash holy post. You'll get additional stories and meditations, premium music, soothing sounds, and more. Support the Holy Post podcast and get 25% off by going to abide.co slash holy post. That's A-B-I-D-E dot C-O slash holy post to download the Abide app and get 25% off your premium subscription. And now back to the show. If you're anything like me, you probably know very little about the history of indigenous peoples in North America, apart from what you may have learned in high school history class, which really isn't that informative. On top of that, you probably know nothing about the history of Christianity among Native Americans. Well, to fill in that gap is my guest today, Dr. Matthew Milliner. He is the Associate Professor of Art History at Wheaton College. You might be wondering what an evangelical white art history professor has to say about Native American history. And yet, you'd probably be surprised. His new book is called The Everlasting People, G.K. Chesterton and the First Nations. This conversation with Matthew Milliner, frankly, I wish it had lasted another hour because it was so interesting and I hope you find it interesting as well. Because in it, he doesn't just fill in some gaps of our missing knowledge, but he talks about how properly understanding both Chesterton's writings and the history of Christianity among First Nations will bring down some of our illusions and mythologies around progressivism and cultural dominance. It's a really wonderful book. I can't recommend it enough. And just to get you started, here is my conversation with Matthew Milliner. Matthew Milliner, welcome back to The Holy Post. Thanks for having me back, Sky. I am delighted. Your book came across my desk, I don't know how many weeks ago. And I got to admit, when I saw the book, I thought, what the heck is this? Yeah, I think that's been the reaction of most people. <laughs> I, 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 in a delightful way, though, I'm a big fan of taking unexpected things and, and kind of smooshing them together. That's what I did in my first book. Um, it didn't sell anything, but it, I enjoyed writing it. 
and then I saw your book. So you've taken G.K. Chesterton and Native American culture and religion and kind of smush them together. I, at first, I didn't see your name on the book. I just saw the book and the title, which is The Everlasting People, G.K. Chesterton and the First Nations. And then I saw your name. I'm like, wait a minute. That's the art historian from – what does art history have to do with this? So quite a mashup. I'm kind of curious. Uh, when you pitched this book, did the publishers say you were crazy? Yes, uh, but they came around. They came around. It took a while. Clearly, yeah. So this, so this is how it works. So I, there's a lot of ways I could approach this, but one is um, Cornell West came to Wheaton's campus not too long ago, and a student. I mean, he ta- gave a wonderful talk. Um, the Jesus came out more in Cornell West than I've ever seen before. He wasn't that way. I knew him in grad school, and just, uh-huh. but when he came to Wheaton, I think who he really was could unfurl, and. Um, it was such an amazing talk. It was a packed house. And the student got up and said, Dr. West, Dr. West, what should I do about, about my white privilege? And he didn't miss a beat. He just said, well, deploy it. Next question. <laughs> and, and so around this time, I get invited to be a part of the Wade Center lectures, which are a wonderful series of lectures of plumbing the depths of the Wade Center, which has the collected papers of C.S. Lewis, of G.K. Testerton of Dorothy Sayers of Owen Barfield, uh, you know the Inklings crowd and and the the penumbra around them, and I was asked to do this, and I'm like, okay, well, I guess you would count that as privilege, and and I'm let's let me use it, and so I'll take this opportunity to talk about one of the figures in there, and I'm going to use it to draw attention to the indigenous community, which is not normally something that would be done. So I said, yes, I'd be delighted to participate in the Wade Center series, but I only will do so if I can talk about uh, something unexpected. And so I chose, I could just as easily have chosen C.S. Lewis, like that uh, th- we, are, we are ready for an indigenous reading of the Chronicles of Narnia. In fact, I, mm. I, I put that in there um, at the end of the book. What you simply do is you say that uh, the white witch is, is uh, colonization and the deep magic underneath it all is the indigenous community. And the only way forward is the Prince Caspians of the world to realize their colonization history and therefore to unify in the worship of Aslan. Very exciting. But, you know, there's a lot on Lewis. I didn't go in that direction. But G.K. <laughs> Chesterton was the perfect fit because he has written so wonderfully about cave paintings in Europe. And at a time where they were being dismissed as retrograde, as the early uh, humanity before it progressed into the majesty of the early 20th century human European, who is the culmination of all things. Chesterton was saying, yes, no, th- these, these actually paintings are proving the, the reality of the image of God. So he, he was an early celebrator of ancient cave paintings. And we have also discovered cave paintings in North America that Christians and non-Christians seem to sort of ignore. And I want to say, the same truth is available on this continent, this incredible indigenous history of artistry that nobody knows about, even though it's all around us, that testifies to the magnificence of our being made in the image of God and to Jesus as well. So my, so that was my goal. And it, it, it was, I mean, Chesterton wrote so much. You can do so much with his work. And the tendency right now is just, oh, let's... Um, cancel him because he's insufficiently up to date according to whatever we think right now. But instead, I'm like, let's bring him along and and use him as an illuminating tour of of the way to understand the indigenous community that in his two visits to this continent, he expressed, I don't know anything about these people, but I wish I did. I wish I did. To that degree, your book um, exposes to me just how American my education has been because my knowledge of of native people's history and culture is it's just this massive blind spot like I I I know virtually nothing and so it's hard to believe that as much as I've studied over my life this is an area that I've just I've never been I've never been interested in enough to pursue on my own but it was never introduced to me as a student whether as a kid or college student or a graduate student as a as an important area that I need to learn about in order to be a fully rounded 
person in North America. So you and me, like both. Chesterton, I, I want to know more. Yeah. And, and, um, and go ahead. Well, and that's it. I had that same deficit in my education. And what one can do is one can therefore, you know, saw yourself off the tree of your education um, and fall down with the branch and say, well, I want nothing to do with it, with the root and the trunk that got me to this place. So I'm just going to saw it off. Or you can say, I need to grow and I want to grow with the things that I've learned before. And that's why I need it because I'm a big Chesterton fan. Yeah. And so he was really formative for me. And so the temptation was there. Oh my gosh, I've been completely duped by a, a Eurocentric education. I never will read another word of C.S. Lewis or G.K. Chesterton again. Um, and, or you can say, maybe as a North American, instead of fetishizing the Inklings and going to Europe and going goo goo gaga when I walk in the streets of Oxford with my you know tweed and pipe pretending I'm one of the Inklings, I can well, not to mock that. I mean, it's important. They're amazing figures. But I can say, I want to think not as they thought, but the way they thought. I want to think um, using the same skills that they developed um, in England, tapping into the deep roots of English lore, as Tolkien did, right? But instead, do it here. Do it with Native American lore. I'm convinced this is a move that they would have made if they had lived where we live today. And yeah, so I, I mean, I, I've heard similar points of view from Bible scholars who argue it's not enough to just look at scripture, you need to see through scripture, right? And exactly. see your world through. And you're essentially doing that with Chesterton as you look through his writings to create an interpretive framework for native art, native religion. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's a really, I, this is what I loved about the book. It's, it's a fascinating, um, smashing together of unexpected things that generates a, a synergistic illumination that you wouldn't get otherwise. Okay. For the sake of people who are listening to this, who are going, okay, what on earth are these guys talking about? What does Chesterton have to do with our understanding of first nations? Um, back us up a little bit and talk sure, about sure. Chesterton's, um, well, for lack of a better word, his beef with modern ways of thinking about progress. And you right. juxtapose his way of thinking with H.G. Wells in the early 20th century. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Totally. So, I mean, and there are people, there are H.G. Uh, Wellses in the early 21st century too. Totally. Um, who, are, who are saying, well, we just have to, the whole history of the human race is detritus that we need to cast beyond us as we move into the transhuman future. And- we know those people, right? They, they are they are best-selling authors who who talking about how we're going to hack our brains in order to to come to some new understanding. And Chesterton experienced that in the early 20th century, and H. G. Wells happened to be the person who was articulating that. And so, what Wells was suggesting is that pre World War II, keep in mind, after World War One, okay. Are we just done with this war thing? Let's just leave this behind. We yeah, now the war to end all wars. Yeah, we, we, and 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 now that we've kind of got this aggression out of us, we can um, have. How about this? A, a unified like League of Nations where we all gather together and sort out our differences with good chatting. Right? It was before the UN. It was this these dreams of world peace, and we're just going to leave religion behind because you know that just causes conflict, and we'll have some kind of unified thing that we know is like kind of the new age, which is the punchline to a joke. But for him, it was really, oh, we'll get to this new pan-spiritual faith. So Chesterton sees this just like we see it today, right? In, in On the airport shelves, you'll find these books, right? And, and he says, no, he calls the bluff. He's like, that's ridiculous. And so Wells writes his outline of history that makes that progressive case that sort of looks down upon the, in, the indigenous person. I mean, he's Wells is not a racist. We got to keep that in mind. He's attacking that. But Chesterton nevertheless perceived this um, prejudice toward the primitive. And he attacks the prejudice toward the primitive and say says, you know what? Um, consciousness emerged with as much of a miraculous uh, e explosion as the Big Bang itself. And the evidence we have for that is the stuff that splattered on walls that animals don't do. That's the, em the, the evidence for the Imago Dei. He, and it works perfectly with a view of the world that that goes with Genesis, that all of a sudden humans have something that the animals don't. And so 
Uh, in so doing, Chesterton develops a worldview because he's so incorrigibly Christian that defies the progressivism of the early 20th century, just as we need to defy the progressivism of the early 21st century with a defense of, wait for it, the underdog. So when you're looking at history, stop looking for the winner, look for the loser, and that's where you'll find Matthew 25, the image of Jesus, the least of these. And so, so in his world, he's like, okay, who's that? Ah, the Irish, right? You British are conquering the Irish and you see them as dirty and a big deficit and Catholic, right? And he's going to defend them. And I think he would have done the exact same thing for the Native Americans in, on this continent if he had had the opportunity. And he intimated here and there that he, that he wanted to do that. Okay. Uh, go, going back to Wells for a second and an early 20th century progressivism and its analogous form in the 21st century, in both of these ways of viewing the world, history is progressing, right? It's it's advancing in some way. And the natural result of that, if you consider yourself a progressive, is you end up ranking people or groups of people based on their usefulness in advancing that trajectory of history. Oh, of course. Yeah. And so certain groups are pro- you know, progressively advantageous because they're helping us achieve the world that you think we're supposed to achieve. But other groups any group that is a hindrance to that progress or an earlier iteration of that progress is no longer useful and is diminished. Dead and you see, that, you see that at work today in so much of progressive ideology as well. I, I mean, I, I don't mean to name names, but this is Yuval Noah Harari, Harari's thesis. And yeah. I have friends who they, they soak up this book. Why do they soak it up? Because Harari has the boldness to cast a universal vision of history. And everyone wants that. And we academics have so siloed ourselves and specialized. I wouldn't dare talk about Renaissance art history. I'm a Byzantine art historian. And it's like, okay, I get it. It's boutique. It's classy. There's integrity to it. But for goodness sakes, if you don't talk about the wide sweep of history, someone else is going to. And so... Chesterton sees Wells doing that. He replies with the everlasting man of the everlasting relevance of Jesus to all of human history, all of global history. And that's what we need to do to people like Harari. We need to say your view of progressive history, which by the way, in the early, I mean, Andy Crouch, God bless him, points this out on Twitter. He's like, look, I don't want to knock people, but Harari did say that we had outgrown plagues. And that we were able, we had everything necessary to overcome them. I'm like, come on, man, that was pre-COVID. It's like, sorry, you, you, eh, wrong. You know, yeah. I mean, human history is freighted with sin. And Chesterton, because he's such a Christian, calls this, I love this, the, the, um, the stone that the builders of, that the utopianists rejected, right? Yes. <laughs> and and that's, we always want to reject that stone because it's not flattering to us as individuals or to us as our cultures, right? And, and Chesterton's like, you can't give up on that doctrine. It's just a fact. It's, it's what's with us. And therefore that's what we need to reinsert into these imaginative fantasies that will inevitably lead to new injustices that we have that we cannot yet imagine which i feel are might be very much on the horizon. Okay, so here here's the element that some people listening to this might be confused by because in 21st century north american political cultural context we usually think of progressives i'm using air quotes we think of progressives as those who are advocating for minority groups or advocating for marginalized people. And yet There are other groups that progressives today would sideline as a hindrance to progress. Mm -hmm. But when you go back 100 years, the progressives had a kind of different attitude. And for example- They invented eugenics. (laughs) Yes, they invented eugenics. You you quote Chesterton in speaking about Charles Dickens as uh, would say, quote, that Charles Dickens sees nothing in the Red Indian except- that he is barbaric, retrograde, bellicose, uncleanly, and superstitious. In short, that he is not a member of the special civilization of Birmingham or Brighton. So the progressives then would look at a Native American and say, well, they're not progressive enough. They're not helping us advance civilization because 100 years ago to advance civilization meant white European colonialism. Precisely. Um, So 
let's go back then to, I don't know, pick a time in history, not even that long ago, in some places still today. How has progressivism and colonialism in, it, in, in its progressive form 100 years ago, how has that affected the way many of us tend to think about Native peoples and Native cultures? We thought that somehow European techniques, right, their ability to manipulate uh, matter to create tools for advancement, somehow gave us an ontological uh, edge, right? We, we were somehow better in one way or another. And that ideology so um, blanketed civilization of the West as it moved forward that it was, uh, you couldn't think your way out of it. And look, here's the thing. Were there many Christians who were coded with that ideology that nevertheless made true statements and did heroic work in building the church? I would say yes. I am not a monolithic thinker in the sense that, well, I have to cast all of that aside because Chesterton was to a degree infected with that, right? As as anyone at that time would have been infected. But what happens is his Christian faith gave him enough of a, of a lever with which to gain some resistance against his dominant culture, and therefore he could start to see his way out of it. And, and so what I'm suggesting is you can de- attain a degree of what we might call you know, enlightenment from the, the blindness of your own moment in order to critique it. But you have to have an anchor with something beyond the culture in order to do that. And the only quote unquote thing beyond culture that I know of uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Please immediately email me if you know of something beyond culture. The only thing I know of that's beyond culture is the revelation of God in Christ, because it's the thing that came from outside the cosmos as we know it. That's why the church has had this amazing history of being able to perceive at any given moment, here's what's what you're missing about our, our time. And that's what in his great book, Orthodox, if you're going to pick one Chesterton book, that's the way to yeah. go. Yep. He says, I, like, I don't get it. You can't critique Christianity from both sides. You're saying, oh, uh, it's too elaborate and there's too many dressings and, and too much um, money spent on these beautiful worship. And yet at the same time, um, you, you, um, you're too into social justice and activism. You care too much about these uh, causes that are that are left behind that we should. He's like, you can't have both of those critiques. And he looked at the people of his day that were critiquing Christianity for being too womanly and too pro-woman. And he's like, which is it? Please explain it to me. And he finally realizes that this Christian thing called the church, it's critiqued from both sides because it's so massive that it's able to contain both truths at the top of their energy. And that's what leads him to the conclusion of orthodoxy. I'm going to migrate toward this thing called the church because it's the only thing that is other. And so he does that. Um, and, and what, and just to toggle back to your question, Sky, I think what we need to realize is that we probably don't know what those things are yet now. Our culture is blinded in ways that most of us are unable to see. But if you sink your taproots deep down into the Christian soil, you might get to the point where you're starting to say, here's where we've got it wrong now. What's interesting, I think, is that now as the culture kind of leans toward, okay, but the minority at any cost, that's what matters the most. I'm glad for that. That's a trickle down effect of Christian thinking. And there's no Mm -hmm. way to get to that thinking other than Christianity. That's Tom Holland's point in Dominion. (laughs) Like if you are an atheist who is all for the, the, the oppressed, like it or not, you're, you're, you know, it's secondhand Christian smoke that you're token right right there, buddy, even if you're not putting it to your lips. (laughs) So all that to say, that's why I think the Native American thing for many of us now, like, whoa, well, how stupid people were to think they were retrograde. Now we know they were environmental geniuses because they built homes that could decompose uh, and then you could move. It's like they're like green certified in 1650. Yeah. OK, I get our lead certified. And so the, the point is um, we, we have migrated to that right now which is wonderful. And if we're really going to be anchored to the Christian church, we need to be thinking um, what ways do we need to be undeceived by our culture? And to toggle that to the book, the way to see that is that people who are pro-native right now, 
who are pro First Nations, who are pro Indigenous, and it's an instinctual, almost um, uh, automatic uh, sympathy that people have now. That also is profoundly problematic. Because you have a sort of new age generic appropriation of indigenous culture in the wider populace. Philip Jenkins wrote a great book called Dreamcatchers, where he just he lampoons he he shows you just how um, a, a, how um, negative it can be when some white guy like me gets into Native American studies. How the damage that we can do. But what I'm trying to point out in this book is that those people who are instinctually pro indigenous today often fail to realize that the indigenous community is profoundly Christian, a massive swath of it. And that's yeah, and what that's, I wanted to point out. Well, and that's what I want to get into next, because um, I, one of the reoccurring themes on our podcast for the past 10 years is everything is more complicated than you think. <laughs> right? We want Amen. simple, we want simple, cut and dry, black and white explanations for everything, but the world is way more complicated. And one of the complications you bring out in the book is the fact that so many of us are taught that Christianity was used by European colonists as as a way of essentially dis- eliminating native cultures, right? Of of just purging mm-hmm. native cultures and making North American natives into Europeans. But it's, it's way more all most people here. It's just all most people here, and they stop right there. Exactly. Right. But it's all way, way more complicated because yes, indeed, there were plenty of Native Americans who did adopt Christianity. But as you put it, um, we we tend to think of it as being used as a weapon of colonization, but it was used as a weapon against colonization as well. So, exactly. I mean, we don't have a ton of time here, but can you give some of your favorite examples of the way that Christianity was incorporated into native communities and cultures in a way that was really empowering and used against European colonization? Absolutely. And th- so the, the, there is so much research done on this. Beautiful volumes in Canada. There's a volume entitled uh, Mixed Blessings, which is a, a full-scale pushback against a generation of scholars who just found the anti-Christian natives lifted them up. And there were some. We have to keep sure. that in mind and said, that's the true story. But um, my favorite story in this regard is um, so we had a faculty seminar where Scott Stevens, a Mohawk Indian who now leads a center for indigenous studies at Syracuse. He came into our seminar and he said, people come up to me and say, were your parents of the traditional religion? And his reply to them is, yes, they were Anglican. And so am I. <laughs> because the gospel was received enthusiastically. We're in Illinois. Let's talk about Illinois in particular. Did the Jesuits do bad things? Yes. Did every Christian do bad things? Of course. I mean, don't get into my biography. But what happened in the early Jesuits, Jacques Marquette in particular, not far from here in Utica, Illinois, you can go to it. It's an archaeological site. 5,000 Kaskasia Native Americans in the Illini Confederation gathered to hear Jacques Marquette. Now, remember, uh, some guy coming from across the sea is like an alien visiting today. People would show up. And right. Marquette preached the mass, and it was received jubilantly. Now, there's some good books about all the bad things that Jesuits did. But we got to keep in mind that that happened later as the tide of white refugees, my ancestors, was so overwhelming that those initial moments of reception and enthusiasm were overcome. And we can now embrace them again today and recover them. But we have to keep in mind that the best scholars of Marquette, who in secular academic presses have written, it's not that Marquette wanted to take possession of the Illinois, the Illini Indians. They took possession of him. He said, I don't want to give them a French Bible. I want to translate it into Illini. Fast forward to 1699 and at Cahokia, which by the way, was a site of human sacrifice at great scale. So let's not romanticize Native Americans, right? There is, I mean, again, original sin, right? But nevertheless, at that site, the the human sacrifice had long ceased. Cahokia fell under, without any help from white people, it collapsed on its own because of oppressive totalitarianism, okay? So, but that is long gone. 
And these Jesuits now have translated the Bible into a Illini, li- a li- and there is a Jesuit priest, I'm sorry, a non-Jesuit priest who comes up, grabs that Bible, and tries to destroy it because they should become French first. Hmm. They should become European first. When I in that moment, therefore, people were talking about that Illinois moment in Versailles, for goodness sakes. It was before wow. Illinois as a state. But I mean, this was an international incident. The question is, should they be able to read their Illini dictionary? Fast forward to 1992 in Haddonfield, New Jersey, where I grew up. Nobody said when they preached the gospel to me, now nah, you need to become Spanish first, young man. Right? Nobody, th- no, they said they, they took my own language, they took my own cultural conditioning. And they translated the gospel into a way a 15-year-old teenager in America could understand it. Everyone should receive that in their own culture. And so that the, happened on this continent, but we forgot it. So the, this this is a raging debate among missiologists and has been forever. It's just what degree of, of indigenous culture in any culture can the gospel inhabit and how much does it have to change? And you bring up in the book and in some of the other articles I read uh, about the book, like there's an enormous amount of evidence that on the Trail of Tears, many of those Native Americans were Christians, and they left Christian artifacts and stories mm-hmm. that documented their trauma on the Trail of Tears. So, you know, the the narrative I inherited was the natives had Native religion, the Europeans had Christianity, and the European Christians drove out the Native Americans. But you make the point that no, this was Christians doing this mostly to other Christians. Th- that is an indisputable fact of the record. And Which means that this wasn't a disagreement over religion. It was a disagreement over culture. That's the kicker. So you use that information to dispel yourself of the illusion of quote unquote Christian America. Right. Because if it was, if see, here's the thing. If all that was happening, the forces that work on this continent, if all that was happening was the great Christian nation moving westward, then as soon as a, a Potawatomi became Christian, they would be like, on board. Right. But they did. And they're like, wait, nothing changed now? No, we're still kicking you out. I mean, literally right, which, ethnic cleansing. That's what yeah, it was. Okay. We, let's get we, this ethnos and erase it from the Midwest. Christianity did nothing. Which is another example of how throughout various points in history, white supremacy masqueraded as Christian supremacy. And that's just not the reality no. of what happened. Okay. And the um, scales fall off and you say, praise be to God, this is so much bigger than my ethnicity. And my ethnicity matters, thank goodness, right? But whiteness, and to get more specific in gradations there, matters. It's dignified by God, but not the only one. It, it all with, with all these other ethnos as well. Okay, so to wrap this up and kind of bring it back around to Chesterton a little bit, I know, and I've been with Christians who get really, really, really uncomfortable when they see Christian theology or practices or beliefs integrated with a culture that they think of as non-Christian. And yet Chesterton wrote about how pre-Christian Europe, pagan Europe, when Christianity came into that continent, it took a lot of pagan symbols and pagan ideas and pagan artwork and incorporated that into Christianity. And we just came through the holiday season. The Christmas tree is a pagan symbol that has been reallocated for Christian purposes. Native peoples did this as well. But a lot of the integration of Christianity with native storytelling, native symbology, native ritual it, it makes white European traditional Christians kind of creeped out or uncomfortable, or they feel like this is synchron- syncretism. I, I, I want to say to those people, and first of all, I'm glad you are defending the tradition. I'm glad you believe in truth. I'm glad that you are jealous for the Lordship of Jesus. And then I want to say, you need to put your Bible away and stop reading it because Canaanite is the background of Hebrew and Greek was a pagan language and it's what the New Testament is written in. So you better get totally purified before it's too late. Exactly. And it's like, and I mean, you know, that's a, that's a, a ribbing kind of response, but I, I, I mean, the great answer to this, it, it, this is the book to read. My book is a, is a gateway drug to uh, the books written by indigenous Christian authors like Richard Twist or Cheryl Bear or Casey Church. I mean, this is, but, and I cite them so that you know where to go in, in this book. But Richard Twist in his book, One Church, Many Tribes, he says, he deals with this because, and he says, so he's a great evangelical convert, 
Lakota himself. And he said, um, women came to me and said, um, this, uh, all this jewelry is infected with natives evil spirits because, um, we got this, uh, piece of jewelry from, from a, a tribe and we tried to, um, we knew it was like giving people bad dreams and we tried to throw it in the water and get rid of it. And then it jumped off the water and came back to us. We knew it was possessed by demons. And so we burned it. And that's why we don't believe in any indigenous regalia of any kind in Christian church services. And here was Richard's response. So important. He did not dismiss them as superstitious. He said, you know what? I believe that Satan probably did infect that piece of jewelry. But he said, you know what? He didn't do it to all of them. <laughs> and what I have here is consecrated to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And Cheryl Bear, break my heart this story. She told about these missionaries who had come to her reservation in Canada on the in the um, northwest of this country, the southwest of theirs. And and they would say, oh man, we really had to pray up here before because we know this place is so kind of infested with evil. Um, and so she was so offended. She's like, gosh, I hope my grandfather didn't hear you say that. Because you know what? I really need to pray up when I go to the mall. Hmm. <laughs> and that, you want a pagan culture, right? I mean, yeah. not that there are any malls left, but I mean, it's like, for goodness sakes, uh, there is so much infected Christian culture across the board. The ideal is to get, grow, draw closer to Jesus Christ and realize he's more powerful than any evil spirit, whether it's in our culture or in indigenous culture. And his job, the job of the Holy Spirit, is to redeem, to baptize, to uplift every culture in the world. It never happened on this continent, but praise be to God, it's not too late because we still have time to retroactively do that work today. And it will enlighten and enrich your faith like nothing else. Yeah, I think what you're articulating is a, is a question I have to ask people regularly when I go and speak or we talk through all kinds. Of, it, it feels to me like an awful lot of Christians believe in a God who replaces things rather than a God who redeems things. Yeah. yeah. And and that is, yeah. it's embedded in our eschatology in a lot of white evangelicalism. It's embedded in our cultural dynamic. We don't believe that things actually get redeemed. We think they need to be replaced. And what we want to replace them with are our preferences, yeah. <laughs> our cultural biases and preferences. You reminded me of right. when I was a college student, I went to uh, Turkey and I was at a mosque in Istanbul. I think it was the Blue Mosque. It's just a mm -hmm. huge, beautiful, unbelievably ornate mosque. And I was there with some other American college students, Christian college students. And one of the students came out of the mosque and was visibly upset. Mm -hmm. And one of one of the other people there asked him, you know, why, why are you so upset? And he's like, I, I just get so angry that they worship a false god here. And this older, wiser person said, um, or he asked the older, wiser, like, why aren't you upset that they worship a false god here? And he said, this is back in the 1990s when the bulls were at their peak, the Chicago mm -hmm. bulls. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what? They worship a false god at the Chicago stadium as well. Oh, <laughs> and you don't, you don't get upset when you go to a bulls game, do you? <laughs> right. And, that, and then that, he said the difference, permissible. Yeah. the difference between the blue mosque and Chicago stadium is at least the blue mosque is beautiful. Yeah. It's an arch arch architectural wonder of the world. And the Chicago stadium was torn down and replaced by the United center. Cause it was such a nasty place, but yeah, um, yeah we're often blind to, our own cultural idols, and we just point out those are the cultures we don't understand. So, Matthew, thank you so much for this book. Thank you for beginning to open my eyes to these issues that I have just not paid any attention to. And yeah. I, you are sort of that gateway drug for me a little bit. And I and I want to pick up some of these other works and and read more deeply and come to a deeper appreciation of um, just the land I'm living on and the history yeah. of of the people here and. So I, I do regret that it's been a blind spot for me for too long. Well, let me just in closing, Sky, point out that those who would, who would, who would be concerned about, and I give you some examples of, of indigenous Christian worship in the book, some extreme, some just traditional Sunday worship, and it's, it's, it's incredible. But we, we have to keep in mind that um, there are many indigenous people themselves. There are books written um, to attack those who would argue for this for this, um, I wouldn't call it syncretism. I would call it indigenized Christianity. Yeah, and and we do have to keep in mind that sometimes when uh, Native Americans would convert, they would themselves would repudiate everything to do with their culture, just right. like uh, you know someone would throw out their TV set, right? If they became a Christian today, good for that, right? Can Christians intelligently navigate uh, TV as they mature? I sure hope so, right? 
Uh, but nevertheless, there's that initial. So that initial repudiation might be necessary, contextually speaking. You might go to a reservation and be like, gosh, why is it just a plain white church? Why isn't it filled with? Well, they might be in that moment of renunciation. But again, it's like, and so, and you might say, because you have to be crucified with Christ and I want to crucify the culture that came before me. But there's also the resurrection, crucified and risen with Christ. And that we are living through, if I could say anything, some people, oh, if only I could live in Italy and Florence in the 1400s, <laughs> right? And, and be a, around all these great Fra Angelico and Renaissance artists. You are living through that if you live in this country today. You are living through a rebirth a recovery of indigenous culture. Find it in your area, get to know them, read the books. You in inevitably find a Christian Native American in a tribe near you who, who you can read their work and, and meet them. Um, what a, this, is, this is an opportunity that people um, have long wished for that, that we have today. Matthew, thank you again for being with us, for introducing this topic. Again, the book is called The Everlasting People, G.K. Chesterton and the First Nations by Matthew Milliner. Hope to have you back on again soon. Thank you, Sky. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Phil Vischer Enterprises, that's Phil's company, and Sky Pilot Media, that's Sky's company. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, and more.